Hi, good evening. I am Linda Maroney. I am the programmer for the One Take Film Festival and documentary film series at the Little Theater, both of which are presented by WXXI. And tonight, um, we're here at the virtual Little Theater to talk about Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy. This film was going to be part of the One Take Film Festival this year, which unfortunately we had to postpone. Um, but we're here now and we have audiences uh, able to see it through the virtual Little, so that's a really exciting um, part that we're doing. Uh, one small shout out to Selena's Mexican Restaurant. They are our community partner for this series of screenings of Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy. Uh, we thought it was the perfect movie to do dinner and a movie with. And um, you can pick up some of their stuff curbside right now. And actually, if you mention Little Theater in the notes, you get a free small side of guac. So what's not to love about that? Anything. <laughs> Anything, Love's right. So my guest this evening is Elizabeth Carroll here, the director of Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy. And we'll start with just a few, a few questions for me. And um, this is running through Facebook Live, so people might be commenting or having their own questions that have seen it. Um, and so that will come up as well. I'll feed you those questions as they come up. I'm guessing if you're here, you have already seen the film. Uh, but if not, I apologize for any spoilers that we may bring about, um, but that's just part of it. These screenings at the Little are really important to our community right now and, and to filmmaking community all around. So um, thank you for participating in that way. Uh, we'll begin um, at the beginning. Um, so my first question is, you know, I was really unfamiliar with Diana Kennedy myself. Um, although after seeing your film, it was very clear that she was long overdue for a, a serious documentary about her and her work. Um, so what was the aha moment for you thinking, okay, I need to make a film about this person and I need to do it now? Yeah, so it, um, <laughs> it's funny because there were, there were two moments that I would call aha moments, but I, I never knew or expected that she would ever let me do a film about her. Um, so initially I, I was working on a different project that was a little bit broader about sort of passing down food traditions as a matriarchy in Mexico. And I wanted to examine how that looked in a contemporary uh, context. Um, so I was looking for Mexican women to interview specifically for this project. And then I found Diana Kennedy and I also didn't know anything about her, really. I had maybe heard about her in passing, but I had not ever been briefed on, you know, the breadth of her work and, and everything that she'd done. So I came across her on Wikipedia and I was like, how do I not know about this woman? You know, like, she's amazing. She's done all this work. She's written all these cookbooks. Like, everyone should know who she is. This should be like a household name. Um, so that was the first moment where I was like, okay, this seems like a problem that needs a solution. You know, but at that point, I had never made a feature film, so I by no means was like, I'll be the one to do it. You know, I don't, I think it was like, I was like, well, this is just a lapse in education or something like that. Um, and then I, you know, but I wanted to interview her. I was like, well, she's important. She would be huge for this. And um, I even thought, I was like, she would raise the profile of my little film. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I was like, God, I would just love to find her. And then, but I didn't know how she lived. She was 91. She was living in the mountains in Michoacan, Mexico. And I was like, how do I even go about trying to contact this person? Um, does she have an email address? You know? Um, so I was looking around on the internet one afternoon. I was living in Austin, Texas at the time where I now live again, but took a break, moved to New York. <laughs> um, and so I was at this coffee shop and I was, you know, on a Wikipedia and I was kind of like, oh, I'm, I guess I'm not going to find her, you know, I'm not going to find her email. So I gave up and I closed the computer and I went to this bookstore in downtown Austin, like 30 minutes later. And I drove into the parking lot and looked at the marquee and I was just there to get a book about Oaxacan food because I was, you know, following along with the subject matter. And I pulled into the parking lot and looked at the marquee and it said book signing with Diana Kennedy tomorrow. Right, that doesn't like, happen, yeah. Yeah, and I was just like, what is going on? This is like, did, did the simulation inject that idea into my mind and then I saw her and then 20 minutes later, it's like, it was just too serendipitous to be real. It just didn't make any sense. 
So I went inside and I was like, is this, this is happening tomorrow, right? This is, and they were like, yeah, yeah, here's her publicist email. Go ahead and write an email, set up an interview. And I was like, great, great. Wow. You know, and then I like got back in my car and I was just like, this is the easiest thing I've ever done. This is not supposed to be easy, you know? That was the last easy thing. <laughs> um, so your original project, you said it was a much broader project. Was that meant to be a film as well? Or were you going to make it as a book or? Okay. It was, yeah, it was going to be, it was going to be a documentary project, but okay. I had only been thinking about it for maybe 24 hours. When oh, was so it was really, really early it was on. Very new and out of nowhere. And yeah. The die. So, um, so she must have been approached before. Had she been approached before to make films about her? And she said yes. no. And how did how did you sway her? How did this all come about? Then? Well, so apparently, the story goes. She told me that the night that I met. So, all right, from the beginning. So I sent the email that the bookstore had given me, and I was like, you know, hey, I would love to interview you for this project. If you'd be willing to have me, blah blah blah. Um, you know, it doesn't, it can be brief. It's no big deal. And I didn't hear anything back. So I was like, okay, she's whatever, maybe didn't get it. And so I go to the event the next day and I see her at the front door and I was like, hi, Diana, I'm Elizabeth. And she, she turns around to me and she goes, oh yes, you're the woman who wants to make the film about me. And I was like, and like going back to the email, I didn't say anything about making a movie about her. I was like, mm. will you interview with me? So it was just funny that she took that and was like, oh, great. Thank God. Someone wants to make a film about me. Um, and so I didn't anticipate that even being an option. And so when she said that, I was just like, yep, that's me. I'm here to do that thing that I hadn't thought of. Um, so that's kind of, it was just, you know, the joke is that it was her idea to make the movie. But, um, you know, I was just spellbound. I just didn't know what to do. I was terrified of her. I, you know, she's really intimidating. Um, so I was just trying to go with the flow, basically. Um, and so that happened. And then we ended up talking after the event. She gives us like a illustrious talk and she was blowing everybody away and talking about sustainability. And she was like, what are you all going to do? You know, as she rants in the film, similarly. Um, and so, you know, I sat down with her after, after the event and after everybody had left and she was like, you're still here, what do you want from me? And I was like, well, Diana, I mean, I think people need to know who you are. You know, like you're a pretty interesting figure and your message is really important right now and people need to hear it. Um, and so that's when she told me that she was like, well, yeah, somebody tried to do a documentary about me last year and they screwed me, so I'm suing them. Oh, I was like, cool. Um, so I was like, I, okay, like no pressure. You know, we don't have to do anything. And she was like, well, you know, I think it's good if we did something, you know? And I was like, okay, well, can we do something? And she was like, sure, as long as you can do everything. And I was like, okay. So that was the beginning of it. So uh, there's, there's so many great quotes in the movie, you know, a lot from her, but, um, but then I loved the quote from Jose Andreas calling her the Indiana Jones of Mexican food. I know she's called yeah. the Mick Jagger, you know, of all this, but, but the Indiana Jones really sort of has that adventurous spirit of hers, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, in, in such a, a large way. Can you speak a bit about her approach to Mexico and how it started and, and, and what it became? Yeah, so, um, you know, as she, as she said with a lot of other things in her life, she kind of went with the flow, same thing, you know, weirdly similar in terms of the serendipity factor in her own life. Um, so she was on a trip in the Caribbean in 1957 that she had taken on a whim with some friends from Canada. She had emigrated to Canada from the UK after World War II. World War II. <clears throat> excuse me and so she's in the Caribbean bopping around and then I think she took a little solo mission and ended up in Haiti in Port-au-Prince and went to this she says that these people she met you know recommended she go to this place called the Hotel Olufsen 
which was apparently where Graham Greene wrote all of his novels. So she ends up there and she walks into the lobby and met her future husband, Paul Kennedy, um, who was the New York Times correspondent to Mexico and Central America at the time. So um, they fall madly in love and she ends up moving to Mexico City to be with him. So it was her husband, you know, future husband, who took her to Mexico, basically, invited her there. And that's why she was there in the first place. But then, you know, I think she had had an interest in food and she'd been cooking, you know, in her past, but she had never discovered anything that lit her up as much as Mexican food and Mexican cuisine in Mexican culture, because it's just intoxicating. I mean, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, so I think it was, you know, it was sort of the whirlwind of that experience ended her up in this place that was totally new and vibrant and exciting and delicious. And, um, and I think that she started to, you know, she started to cook because it was a lot more customary for, you know, wives to prepare the meal and all of that, and to be expected to do that, Con even considering how rebelliously feminist she is. I think she was still, you know, she liked doing it. And so she would be cooking for a lot of the journalists and sort of artists and people who would come through the house, their apartment in Mexico City. Um, and through that, she got really good at cooking Mexican food. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that was, that was the origination of her passion. So we're living in, in a time right now that we're all thinking about our stories and who gets to tell the stories and, and, um, of our different communities and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it seems so much that her thought was based in intention you know, that, that making, pulling all these recipes in, that she was always very mindful of where it was coming from, where it was, uh, who gave her the recipe, that she was very intentional on all of that through the get-go when we weren't having these sorts of conversations. Right. I think that, um, you know, it's interesting that she didn't take the opportunity when she got her first book deal, you know, to go back to the U.S. and open some restaurants or, you know, start a product line or something like that. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about whether or not that's right or wrong, but, you know, it's just interesting that she chose to live in Mexico full time and create her life there and live a sort of more solitary existence, you know, after her husband passed away. And, focus on her study, which to her, I think was, she doesn't call herself an academic, but she is an academic, you know, to an extent. And I think that that um, drive and that pull for her was, is anthropological as much as it is culinary. And, um, you know, it's much less about exploiting or taking what she's learned and, and creating some kind of massive monetary gain that was never her intention. Uh, we have our first question. Um, it is from Jack Garner. He is a local, once upon a time, re now retired national film critic. Uh, and he says, given the way she this started, how controlling was she? <laughs> um, quite. <laughs> I had the same question, but phrased a little differently. Yeah, she was, she's, that's her nature for sure. Um, but it's funny because certain times she'll be really open and she'll just be like, do whatever you want. What do you, what do you want me to do? And those were the moments where I was like, Oh my God, well, what do I want you to do? Because I, I was always expecting her to be like, this is what I'm doing now, you know? And, and our, my approach was always to just kind of show up and turn the camera on and let her go about her day. Um, and not try to, you know, direct her too much because she doesn't take direction very well as it is. Um, you know, and so, yeah, it's her style. It's her personal brand in that way. So I, I think I read that 
um, it took like five years to make this film or was it around five? Six and years? a half from beginning to end. Six and a half. Uh, that wasn't judgmental, don't worry. Um, no, no. It was, it was None more, <laughs> it was more, has your, did, how did your relationship with her change over the course of that time? Because that's a long period of time to, to be working with someone. Yeah, I think in the beginning, you know, we had, we had a level of openness because there was the sense of sort of weird serendipitous magic, if you want to call it that, was shared when we initially met. I think that I, we looked at each other and there was an understanding, not of, you know, I could never compare to what Diana has done with her life and not a, not a peer to peer, you know, thing, but more just, it was okay. Like whatever was happening between us was okay. Sort of like if you like ever have a, feel a ghost presence and you can tell if it's positive, you know what I mean? Like it was like that. It was like whatever you are, we're copacetic. And so then we just kind of got to know each other from there. And she, for some reason, never fully rejected me, which was a miracle. But um, yeah, it, it developed and you know, there were midpoints that were difficult and, you know, we, she's certainly given me her fair share of opinions about things and, and I've had to just sit there and take it. But, um, you know, I think by the end, she realized that I was still working on this project, you know, and it's not that, you know, you don't set out for your first documentary with any idea of making a ton of money. So, she, I think she got that that wasn't my intention either. Um, and that I just really thought that it was important that she, her story be recorded, you know. Um, not that it's all that n noble sounding now, but, um, but yeah, I think that we both understood that we had um, mutual gain from this and that we were in a symbiotic relationship and a business relationship effectively, um, not monetarily, but just sort of functionally so and then by the end you know I think she got more tired and more easily frustrated mm -hmm. by our last couple of shoots and they were really hard um but but she was a trooper how often were you shooting over those six years we would shoot with her once a year okay. um so yeah, it's not, it's not like we were shooting for six years. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would fundraise at home and get a chunk of money and then get the crew together and then do one big shoot each year. Yay. Documentary filmmaking. So lucrative. Yes. So <laughs> it's so glamorous. It's great. Really small budgets guys. <laughs> Um, I, I love the guacamole scene, you know, and your photography of all the food is so beautiful and it's so luscious and it really embeds sort of that, um, that feeling of what is passion, what drives her passion, right? So, but you give that to us on a visual sense as well. So it's really beautiful, but um, how did it taste? Her food. Well, the guacamole, but I'm sure also oh. like... <laughs> like catering if you're having crew like are you bringing in sandwiches you know when you're breaking or what we, happened we would have to just eat a really big meal before we started the day so you know we would eat a huge breakfast and thankfully mexican breakfasts are really big so we would survive until dinner basically and she would offer like a lunchtime snack sometimes if she was feeling generous um but usually she would be like, this is not a restaurant. And we were like, we know, it's okay. We're, no, we're not asking for anything. Do whatever you need. Like, you know, we didn't want to ever seem imposing. Um, but she did, she did offer us some delicious food. The guacamole was very good. Um, and all the stuff that she made for the boot camp um, was incredible. I mean, what they made together was amazing. We would get like the scraps. She would be like, that's the crew. They don't, they don't get anything. You know, this food is for you guys. And we were like, yeah, you know, like, but um, we would get little snacks here and there, which was nice. So she also said in, um, in the film that always get a recipe, like wherever you go, always get a recipe. Did you, have you taken one from her? That's your go-to? 
Mm, I honestly haven't been cooking very much until quarantine. I was going to say, um, we have all this time in quarantine. Quarantine, I've been cooking a ton, but I haven't, <laughs> I haven't cracked any of her books yet. I think there's this like emotional intimidation that mm -hmm. I have around them right now, but um, I will probably do it at some point. Um, I've made her, I mean, I've made her moles and I've made different stuff in the past, but I think once, once things really started to ramp up with the film, I was broke and living in New York and not cooking Diana Kennedy recipes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think her tips, the things that stick with me are not culinary. They're more, you know, about sustainability. And like every time the water's running for too long, I'm like, Ugh, you know, like, or like I have to reuse this plastic bag because that's what Diana would do and like, you know, things like that. I think those are the things that have stuck with me more. So, so that's where I was gonna go next is her passion for sustainability and ecology seems to be equal to her passion about Mexican food. And um, let's just talk about that house for a bit. You know, it seems like it's such an embodiment of her beliefs and her passions. But also, it could be such an amazing teaching tool for so many. You know, I, it seems like it's very remote, but what, what is there a plan of what's going to happen with that house once she passes? Is that, I mean, I it's, would think. It's, un, it's unclear as of now. And okay. I kind of asked around friends of hers and stuff, and everybody is kind of, you know, doesn't know. Um, I think the hope among everyone and the consensus among everyone is that it will be taken over by a museum or some kind of organization that can um, maintain the house exactly as it is um, and hopefully turn it into some kind of cooking center, which I think Diana would definitely want. Um, and a learning center for, you know, biodiversity in Mexico and, and permaculture and all the things that she's so passionate about. So we'll see. It's kind of an unknown. Mm. Um, what about like all the research she's done? She must have a bunch of papers and you know, like all of her records and stuff uh, from her trips and all of her knowledge. Is that being kept anywhere? Yeah, so all of her research materials, right after we stopped shooting um, for the film, she ended up um, contributing them all to the University of Texas at San Antonio. Okay. So that's where they have the largest um, collection of rare Mexican cookbooks in the world. So she donated a bunch of her rare Mexican cookbooks that she'd collected in random markets, stuff from the 1800s that's amazing and super rare, um, along with her entire you know, catalog of research. Uh, we have another question from Bonnie Garner saying, I was really impressed with her from scratch coffee. How was that? Her coffee's amazing. It's really good. It's like Turkish style, really strong. You don't need a lot of it. Um, but she's very particular about her coffee and very protective of it. And she will take it whenever she travels in the U.S. or anywhere. She'll take an allotment of her own coffee with her and she'll like make and, and her French press with her and she'll make it wherever she goes and she won't let anyone else have it because that's the coffee that she brought for herself that she can have on the trip. And it's just, it's another special Dianaism. Um, let's talk a minute about how she's really precise about a lot of things, but there's this flexibility within that precision of, of nature, right? Because nature isn't always precise that there's, you know, things that are ugly or, um, you know, can get infected and different things. And she allows, for, she can hold both of those things at the same time really beautifully. That's a really important point that I had never thought of exactly that way. Because you're right, she's wildly precise when it comes to humans and what they are capable of doing and what they do or don't do and their margins for error. And yeah, I think, I mean, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. But yeah, she's, she loves, I think that, you know, she never had children, never wanted to have children. She's annoyed with people. She lives alone. She doesn't want to be around a lot of people. 
she has a contentious personality and she's not nice to everybody but it's almost as if she's taken all of the energy that she would have utilized on children or you know huge social circle and put that all into the world of her plants um she talked about having a plan for the next five years do you know was that five years ago that she had the plan or was that more recent i mean how much longer do we have you know she says she has her driver's license till she's 100. okay and right now she's 97. so she is saying you know her joke whether or not it's a joke we're not sure but she's saying 100 is is it for her it's her cap yeah. Speaking of the driving, like I could have watched a whole hour of just being in the car driving with her. Like it could just be its own web series of driving with Diana Kennedy. I know. It was amazing. It was hilarious. When we shot that day that we shot, I was on cloud nine. I had like a monitor in the back seat and I could see what she looked like. And I was like, this is the best footage we'll ever get of <laughs> Diana Kennedy. This is the greatest thing ever. It was um, hilarious yeah no it's it's just amazing her you know and and just her swearing is just so elegant in some way and not at the same time like she's she's this dichotomy of so many things that's just so fascinating yeah um how was your access to her like was should she ever say we're not doing this or oh yeah all the time all the time she, she the would time. put her foot down well that's why it's funny because reviews are coming out and it's like the filmmaker chose not to include x y and z and it's like no i didn't have access to those things i i wouldn't love to include those things um you know i guess i could have put a title card up that's like we tried to access this thing but she wouldn't let us have it um but you know she she teased out this idea of her very sort of i don't know I don't know the right word to say, but she's just flirtatious. She's a flirtatious woman and it doesn't matter how old she is and she's super sex positive and she was always alluding to that. Um, and whenever I would press her on it, I would be like, so tell me more, you know, what about your lovers? And what about this and that? She's like, oh no, 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 we'll never get into that. But she, she loved the idea of teasing about it, I think. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, certain elements of her past, early childhood, she never wanted to talk about. And um, Paul, she really didn't like talking about. Mm. Did, because Paul died in what was it, 67 or 68 or something? So there's, 68. so she would never talk about romances after that or. She alluded to them. Right. You know? She was like, you should always take a lover. Don't ever be afraid of taking a lover and don't ever get married. You know, she was like, the only reason I got married was because I was served the love of my life. What did you want me to do? You know, I had to do that. She was like, I never would have gotten married otherwise. It's funny. She's funny. And um, just a minute, talk about her fashion sense, which was phenomenal. I mean, all the scarves and hats and the black leather outfit for the James Beard <laughs> Awards. I mean, it's, her closet is pretty phenomenal. She's very fashionable. She's like... Well, and that's so funny. And, you know, I feel like the title Nothing Fancy kind of encapsulates her in that way because when she's at home, you know, just going about her day and going to the market, she'll throw in whatever and her purse is literally falling apart and there are holes in it. We're like, Diana, why didn't, you, why didn't you get a new purse? And she's like, no, 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 this is all on purpose. Nobody will rob me if, if my purse looks like this. <laughs> so, like, she's got this whole, th you know, system and her theory and everything. And, um, you know, but when, when it's time to look sharp, she turns it on. And she's got Donna Karen and Issey Miyake. She was like, I, need, I really need to write Donna Karen a letter, you know, because she's outfitted me for so many years and, you know, this and that. And, you know, whenever she would come to Austin to visit me, you know, or just be here, because she comes to Texas a lot, I would drive her around and take her to lunch. And then she would be like, make requests of different errands she wanted to take. And Neiman Marcus last call was always on that list um and she just loves it and i love that about her i think it's like so cute she's so chic uh, another question here from laura uh, i'm curious since the director mentioned that originally she wanted to film local mexican chefs oh, hold on a second i have to open it up um i'm wondering how she 
how come we didn't follow up the 35 year relationship with any deeper with the family of sisters cooking family recipes? Can you share how you navigated that choice? I'm guessing possibly because of language challenges. So I guess it's about the, the, the women that you filmed. Right, right. the Mendoza yeah. sisters, yeah. Um, well, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I, there were no language challenges. Um, most of us were fluent in Spanish. Um, so was Diana, obviously. Um, and I think that it wasn't necessarily a choice of not wanting to follow up with them um, or can, you know, expand on, on that. It was just, we, we only had so much time with them in their restaurant. They live in a, a village outside of Oaxaca city. Um, and we were just kind of on a, we were on a tight shooting schedule. Um, so we only got so much time with them in the restaurant and we only got one interview with Abigail. Um, and so I would have loved to have, you know, spent a day with Diana and Abigail and have them cook together or have them even just sit together and talk. But, um, when, when we were there, we only got the one opportunity to sit down with Abigail because she was busy with her restaurant and her mother had just passed away and there was just a lot going on personally. So it wasn't necessarily a choice to, to not include more of them, which is what happened. Um, I guess my last question for you is really, um, what do you have lined up next? What is your next project? Are you going to get back to that larger project that you were initially thinking about? Or is there something else that you have in the works? Um, so I'm looking into doing a documentary series, an episodic series that's focused a little bit more about the history of American food and the American food system. So... That sounds very big as well. You're starting, you're starting all these projects. Another, really another saga. <laughs> but hopefully this one will be a little easier to fund. Knock on wood. Was this one a really difficult film to, to raise money for? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reason why it took six and a half years to make. You know, if, if I had gotten the funding in the beginning, it would have been a two, three year project probably, maybe maximum four. Um, you know, and it ended up being a blessing because we were able to spend more intimate time throughout the course of a longer period with Diana, which helped to shape the narrative a little bit differently. Um, but yeah, you know, it was my first film and I don't think people are like actively opening wallets for first time documentary filmmakers, no matter their subject. Um, so now I have the I have the experience. Which is you have funny. lots under your belt, and so hopefully it'll be much, much easier in that arena so. this time. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, Thank you so much, Linda. Thanks for the, having me. Yeah, Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy is still screening at the Virtual Little through June 4th. So if you haven't seen it, you can watch it, tell your friends, your neighbors, or watch it again. Uh, it's definitely worth it. Uh, we wish you the best and we look forward Thank to you, you coming to Rochester with your next project. I would love to. That sounds great. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. you Have around. a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.